My hope and wish and desire that the message I plan to give you in the next few minutes will be the most important one I've delivered in maybe 20 or 30 years. Uh, I'm a salesperson, so if my mouth's open, I'm selling. I mean, I just can't help it. I've tried to open my mouth and not sell, but I haven't been able to achieve that. So you'll have to forgive me for that. What numbers to the combination for the vault of success have we found that our competitors have not found? What is the basic foundational principle of all of our programs? What is our magic recipe for success? What is our secret ingredient? Whether it's going back to the 1960s, the 1970s, 80s, the principles in our programs are infallible, timeless, and proven to work in the past, now, and in the future. Our programs are designed to empower people to take charge of their own lives and to change their own futures. I have to be careful when I call something uh, magic or say it's a secret because uh, people think that's something mystical. To avoid any misunderstanding, I want to be sure that the word magic and secret of what we go through in our programs for the benefit of our customers is very, very clear. Unfortunately, just because something is clearly defined does not mean it will be accepted and put to use. The most important, fundamental, and basic idea of our programs is often overlooked, sidestepped, and ignored. As a society of individuals, I think all of us associated with these companies are aware that we are creatures of habit. All information, whether in book, video, seminar, speech, or conversation format, is filtered in our minds through our past conditioning and present mental attitude, which for the most part has been severely abused, shortchanged, misaligned, and constricted. That's, that's tough. As a result, most people spend a lifetime floundering in a sea of mediocrity. They achieve only a fraction of what they are capable of achieving. They accept too little too soon and thus live their life in a rut. They filter everything through their indecisive, negative thinking, closed-minded, judgmental, and chloroformed brain condition. You want to say that again? Okay. They, we filter everything through our indecisive, negative thinking, closed-minded, judgmental, and fear-ridden mindset, thus living their lives in a chloroformed brain condition. And that's pretty tough. We put on a judge's robe when we read, listen, and watch, which is totally unfair to our mind, our hearts, and most particularly, our futures. This produces a life of mediocrity. It's the worst possible case of self-abuse. My hope and prayer when I started these companies was that these programs that I wrote would take people out of their rut and their life of mediocrity and some way, somehow, awaken the sleeping giant within them. Some way, somehow, to find that God-given potential that's inside of every one of us that wants to come out that's what my life's about, and that's what your life's about if you're associated with this company. Mediocrity is flying low to the ground like a sparrow when you could soar like an eagle. Mediocrity is being a teaspoon when you were born to be a steam shovel. Mediocrity is playing on a harp that has only one string when our creator gave us a thousand strings to play. Mediocrity is painting technicolor pictures with only one color. Mediocrity is being a bantam when you were born to be a giant. Mediocrity is wishing upon only one star when we're capable of discovering incredible galaxies. I hate mediocrity, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. What is the result of a mediocrity-type mindset? Only an extremely small percentage of what we read, hear, or see has ever, even a half a chance to be remembered, 
let alone being allowed in our subconscious mind, accepted, and then actually applied and put to use. It's my competition. <laughs> I'm really proud of that because none of the other speakers that have been up here this morning have been able to motivate that child to come alive and show its exuberance. <laughs> When we attend a seminar or read a book, we are listening and reading with our present mental attitude, which for the most part is full of fear, worry, indecision, and negative thinking, along with a great deal of prejudgment. When you listen, you actually hear 100% of what comes into your ears. But by the time it goes through your mental funnel of your subconscious mind where you can accept it, and believe it, understand it, and use it, it has been reduced to only about 10% of what came in your ears or of what you actually heard. So the question I think any of us would ask, is there a better method than this method? I say yes, if you would listen with an open mind, withholding all prejudice and preconceived ideas with a learning attitude that is excited about gaining new information with positive expectancy, with a keen ear, and listen closely, with a keen ear of not only what's being said, but what it can trigger in your imagination and creativity that can spark you to have that aha experience. And what is an aha experience? Well, that can explode potentials and possibilities you never dreamed or thought of before. Now turn the mental intake funnel upside down. Then instead of getting only 100% of what you are hearing or reading, by the time it goes through your listening filter system and into your subconscious, it will ignite and explode your creativity, your imagination, your ingenuity, your inventiveness, your resourcefulness, and then what's the result? It comes out not only 100%, but 10 times that amount, a new creative, inventive thought. This is the reason when we see one person outperform another person double, that's why. When you see one person outperform another 10 times, that's why. When you see a person outperform a group of people singularly 100 times, that's why. It's also the way you and every one of your clients should participate in whichever one of our programs that you're using. You then become a possibility listener, a possibility thinker, a possibility participant, and a possibility doer. This will cause permanent change of attitude, behavior, and result. I've used this formula and this system when I listen to a lecture, go to a seminar, read a book, hear a sermon, or listen to a song always expecting the experience to fire up my creativity and turn me on and get that spark, that uh, genius something that's inside of every one of us that I know will come out if you believe it'll come out and you ask it to come out. Let me give you an example. One Sunday I was attending a church service in Waco, Texas many, many years ago. I don't even remember what it was now. I couldn't remember the sermon because you remember I only listened to it one time. On my way home I turned on the radio and I heard a song entitled, It's a Great Big Beautiful World. Well, the song inspired me. I pulled off the side of the road and took out a pad and started making notes, and I wrote an outline for lesson number one of the first SMI program I wrote. That program is now sold, listen to this, several hundred million dollars worth, and was the number one selling self-improvement course in the world for over 30 years. So I've often asked myself this question, what would have happened if I had attended that church service with a negative attitude, was judgmental, worried about something, full of prejudice, preconceived ideas? Well, I can give you the answer. I would have not left inspired, not creative. 
My listening intake funnel would be the same as the majority of the people that attended that church service that day. But I did not use the same intake funnel like everybody else. And thank goodness I never have and I never will. Or when somebody asked me to describe myself, I said, I don't look like anyone else, I don't think like anyone else, I don't act like anyone else, and I don't produce like anyone else. And uh, that's because uh, my creator has put into me something special which I acknowledge and give him credit for. I had my inverted funnel which produced explosive ideas and creative results, ideas that multiply. Now here's another big benefit of an inverted funnel listening. Maybe you could have a chance to be like me. I'm an inverted paranoid. The definition of an inverted paranoid is one who thinks the whole world has conspired to do only good for him. Now, can you, can you imagine what that's going to do if you walk in someplace and you're going to make a sale? You're going to see two trumpeters at the door and a red carpet rolled out when you walk along. And you'll know in your heart of hearts that the people inside that door have been waiting to see you all of their life and dreaming about doing business with you. They want to be your client. And that, that just turns me on. That's exciting. It doesn't make any difference what you're selling or where you're going or who you're talking to. You know they want to do business with you. I feel bad that I can't call on everybody in the world because if you live on planet Earth and you don't get a chance to associate with me, you're going to miss something. <laughs> now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about attitude, aren't we? That's exactly what it's all about. For some reason, in our present culture, we have been taught that you should read more and more books. And boy, this is kind of indicts me, because I know a lot of people here read a lot of books. But let me say something about that that's incriminating to, to those of us that read a lot of books. If we, if we read more and more books and attend more and more seminars, I have this question. If that really worked in and of by itself, why, why is there so little change in people's lives that do that? Here's, here's the reason. According to the National Training Laboratory in Bethel, Maine, what we actually retained from reading books and attending seminars, really, well, it shocked me. Listening to a lecture, that's, you're listening to me right now, you're only going to be able to retain 5% of it unless you get a copy of the video or get it on a CD or get it on a cassette tape and listen to it many, many times. Reading a book, only 10% retention unless you underline it again and again. Take notes beside. Let it turn on that aha uh, uh, experience in you. So I have to say, what practical good is it to read one book after another, attend one seminar after another? Very little. It helps, helps your mind become brain cluttered. And so when I look, when I'm going through a book or going through a, listening to a seminar, I only want it to spark me. That's all. Uh, I do not want to get hooked on the fact that I think I can retain all of that. And it's going to be too much information. Daniel Webster, the originator of the Webster Dictionary, said that he preferred to totally master a few good books rather than to read widely. Now, I read widely, I do opposite of that, and so do several of us, but there's a half a dozen that I've zeroed in on and have mastered their content that's helped change my life. The number one book that I give credit to is the Bible. And... Uh, 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 one of my favorite books and authors back when I was in my early 20s was The Power of Positive Thinking with Norman Vincent Peale and uh, As a Man Think with J.M. Allen. I could give you several others. But let, let me tell you about those books. I read most of them. I read one of them over 200 times. Can you believe that? 200 times I read the same book. We simply cannot afford to overload our, our circuits or clutter our minds. When people immerse themselves, listen closely, when they immerse themselves into one of our major programs that will change their life forever. I did say immerse, and if you're taking notes, put down the word immerse, because that's what it's talking about. When we immerse ourselves, it will help us be more productive, help us live more positive lives, become a total person, live a balanced life. Most minds, unfortunately, have been conditioned to be passionless. They show some light, and you can see that in people's eyes, but they don't have any heat. There's nothing, there, there isn't any excitement or any emotion or any thunder that comes out of their life. To totally master our courses and programs, it's imperative that we bathe in them, immerse and bathe in them, 
until they saturate our very being. They're in our white corpuscles and our red corpuscles. They come out because they can't help coming out. It's imperative that we masticate them, <coughs> chew them slowly, and digest them until they permeate our very being. It has been said that your mental constitution is more affected by a small amount of material thoroughly mastered than 20 books that you read only one time. Little learning can come from just books and seminars that you only have once. In fact, it could almost mentally disable us. We should adopt this, this motto for our company, much, not many. A learned speaker once told me that you should attend any worthwhile seminar six to ten times. Always with a pencil and notepad each time, not taking notes necessarily about the, what the speaker is saying, but it's much more important to be taking notes about what it triggers in your own mind. I have a list of notes on the table of the speakers that we heard this morning, but not one single word of my notes are about what they said. But what I have in my notes is what it triggered in my inspiration and my inventiveness, my imagination of what I can do to help our companies from what they said. And, and that's the way to listen. Our programs are designed to empower people to take charge of their own learning. Our programs are designed so that people will interact, get involved with the goal setting process, and then apply what they learned at home and on the job. Our programs never have been, it was not my intent at the get-go, and it's not now, to be entertainment or fluff or mental cotton candy. They are designed for lasting change or permanent change. Now listen to this one. Some 20 years ago, Shirley Rudd Otley from Trinidad attended our home office training school for 18 straight months in a row. Trinidad's a long way from Waco, Texas. It cost her $1,200 a month. That means $21,600 to get the same training over and over. I used to say, Shirley, what are you doing here? You know our stuff better than we do. And she said, you don't understand. It's the nuances. It's the between the lines. It's the rubbing shoulders with the other people. And I pick up something new, and I get that aha experience each time. Translating that to today's dollars, that must be fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 that she spent in 18 months. That's, a, that's amazing. And then she went on to be a world leader in our business. One of the goals she set was to lose 100 pounds in 18 months. She put it in her plan of action, and she went and bought a dress and put it on a mannequin. I thought that was pretty interesting of how she would look if she weighed 100 pounds less. And she looked at it every day and had a goal that she was going to get a world award, stand up around the stage, and have a picture taken with me in that dress. And she did. She understood the idea of spaced repetition repeated listening and repeated application. I heard of a minister one time in Scotland, and this is South Scotland where my family's from in the Jedburgh area, had the largest library down there, the largest library in Scotland. He delighted in telling about his collection that he had and how he had the habit of browsing through his library. But when he died, this is what his son said about him. His sermons failed to impart to his congregation the power of the books that he was browsing. Now, it's my opinion that he would have had a hundred times more power and zeal and zest in his presentations and sermon if he had picked only three or four or five books in his library, read them, underlined them, highlighted them, made notes, read them again and again, internalized them until they ignited passion and excitement and enthusiasm the kind that comes out because it can't help coming out. Then he would have had conviction and belief in his sermons. This minister might have been considered a scholar, but it was quite evident that his congregation was spiritually dead. We are only stretched mentally when we cogitate, ponder, think, imagine, visualize, and repeat the process of a given thought or idea over and over and over and over and over and over. I hosted a seminar with Ken Blanchard, author of some 20 plus leadership books. I think all of you know him as the author of The One Minute Manager. We had a group of 60 chief executive officers in Central Texas, and during his session he made this comment, we don't need any more information. 
We just need to learn how to apply what we already know and what we've already read. Ken is, by any measure, the number one best-selling author of leadership management books in the world. His books have sold tens of millions of copies. He conducts main, his, his main seminars are Fortune 500 companies. And he says this, the same thing we're saying. Only 10 or 20 percent ever use or apply what they listen to in our programs when they listen only once or if they read through the script. Most adults will never reach their potential simply because they have been conditioned to live a life of mediocrity. The vast store of tangible and intangible potential gets depleted little by little by little. It's like they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. Where did the potential go? They lost it through negative conditioning that they received as children and then adults. And they used more and more spaced repetition repeating those negative, negative comments, either by being, having preconceived ideas or pre-notions or going, in, going into any situation with a negative attitude. Where did I get the idea for condensing books and motivational material and then applying spaced repetition to change people's lives? Did I stumble on it? Well, I guess we could say yes. Did I achieve it by accident? Possibly. I choose to say that I received it as a gift from my creator. Let me tell you the, where I think the embryo is, because people ask me, can you go back? I did this in a, in a radio interview the other day. They said, can you go back and tell exactly where you got the aha idea for this business? Well, I was conducting training meetings with a group of salespeople in my insurance agency back in 1949 and 1950, and I would give them all out books. I spent a lot of money giving books, just like now I give away $50,000, $100,000 worth of books material. So, <clears throat> well, then the next week I'd say, <clears throat> what'd you think of that book? And the first one I gave out was The Power of Positive Thinking. And then one of them was by uh, Dale, Carney, <clears throat> Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I said, what did you, what'd you think of the book? Well, this is what they said. I think it's a great book. Uh, one of the best books I ever read. Well, tell me what, give me an outline of the book. You heard, just heard Seven Secrets of Closing Sales by Charles Roth. What were the seven secrets? No one could tell me any of them. And I didn't know, I didn't know like that from, from that laboratory read about, about the 5% and 10%. I didn't know about that. So I'm confused. Now, it kind of made me angry, to tell you the truth, because I'm wasting my money and giving them the books. So I started condensing the books, and I got a stool and sat in front of them, and I read my condensed version of the book. And then I did it again. I started having a training meeting instead of once a week. I had our training meeting once a day. Everybody had to, had to be there every day before they went out to sell. I didn't care what part of South Florida they lived in. <clears throat> Then I would read it again the next day, I read it again the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, until finally I saw out in the audience, I saw some lights turn on, and then I took those people to lunch and said, what do you want to do with your life? And then, what are you, what are you dreaming about? What did the book tell you? And then they would start telling me, and I said, you want a car? Let's go take a picture of a car. You want a house? Let's take a picture of a house. You want a new suit? Let's take a picture of a new suit. Then one day, I thought, I didn't know anything about doing any business with this. I'm just telling you where the embryo was. A Fuller Brush salesman came to our house, Larry, on 9100 Southwest 61st Court in a junk piece of automobile, and, he, and he, he starts to drive in my circular drive, and he starts to drive in, and he doesn't drive in. Instead, he parks it past the end, just a little bit past, because I wouldn't see his car. He gets out, he's bushy red-haired, I went out and met him at the front door, and I said, young man, if you're going to come and talk to me about something, go get that car and bring it in the driveway. Well, it scared him to death. He went and got the car, drove it in the driveway, and, and he, he got out of it ashamedly. And I said, that is no way to get out of a car. And I said, let me show you how to get out of a car. I went and got in his car, and I got out, and I closed the door, and I said, you slam it, and you walk 10 feet, and then you look back at it like it's a Mercedes-Benz <laughs> or a BMW or a Lexus, or a Cadillac. And I said, because one day if you keep looking at it, it will transform itself into one of those automobiles. And now let me show you the way to knock on the door. You knocked on it like you, didn't, like you were hoping I wouldn't answer. Say, dot, 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 
Let them know there's somebody there with personality, with charm, with excitement, with enthusiasm, with zeal. He stared at me like I was a nut. I invited him in, and I had put, I'm now, was no longer reading the condensations on the stool. I got tired of that, and I started putting them on reel-to-reel tape. I don't suppose anybody in here remembers reel-to-reel tape. I mean, that's really, that's back before 12-inch LP records. And I only, ha- I had a couple of them there, and I loaned him one of the, one of my condensations about attitude. And I said, here, take this and listen to it every day. Come back in a week. He came back in a week. He was still the same guy. I said, take it, read it, listen to it every day. Wait, come back and come back again. He came back, and he was kind of cleaned up a little bit. And I said, let's sit down and talk about your goals. The net of it is he was the number one salesman in Fuller Brush Company for the state of Florida driving in my driveway. This makes me cry. Driving a brand new Mercedes-Benz automobile. Visualization works. Attitude works. Enthusiasm works. Enthusiasm is the emotion management that paves the way for you and your ideas. It shouts in letters 10 feet tall. I've got what it takes. That was the embryo of our business. It was the genesis in my life that led me to this idea. Now, who taught me that idea? It came from my father. He was a cabinet maker in Germany. He was the best teacher I've ever had or ever known. His system was pretty simple. He would tell me, show me, let me, correct me, tell me, show me, let me, correct me. Again and again and again, and he would do this until he hammered home over a period of days, weeks, and months whatever it was that he was trying to teach me or show me. It was the genesis of our system, the magic ingredient. Let me give you an example, my first bike. My dad and I went to the junkyard and bought a broken bike. We didn't have much money then, it was the depression. We bought it home, took it apart. He showed me how to straighten out the frame, how to paint it, how to spoke the wheels. Then to my chagrin and my anger and my annoyance, He had me take it all apart again. When I say take it apart again, he had me take all the spokes out of the wheel. I mean, would you enjoy doing that if you were 12 or 13 years old? Anybody in here? I don't think so. I did it again and again and again and again until I could could do it behind my back. His system must have worked because during my teens, I bought and sold over 300 bicycles, put the money in the bank, had more money at age 16 than any any kid or adult I knew. Another example, we, we were going to paint our house. I thought he was going to go to the store and buy, find out what color the house my, my mother wanted, go buy the paint. He said, no, I've got to teach Paul uh, all about how to make his own paint. So we bought just the, the white lead paint. We got, all the, we got all, the, all the colors, and we did it again and 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 again. again. He'd show me, tell me, correct me, let me. Uh, uh, I didn't enjoy some of that. Another example, my first airplane. Now, Josh, I thought he was going to go to the store with me. We went to the hobby store, and you could buy a model airplane then for 10 cents, okay? And he said, no. He said, design your own. Well, I'll have to admit, at 12, I had a tear in my eye. I didn't know how to design an airplane, so I kind of begged him outside the store, let me just buy one, and let me study it. So he weakened and said, okay. I took, it, I took it apart before I put it together again. I knew if I put it together, I wasn't going to see those parts again. I memorized the ribs, the stabilizer, the engine mount. There wasn't anything I didn't know about that plane. And then I started designing my own. And what happened? I had seven-foot wingspan planes. I built over 25 planes. And I was first placed in any contest I entered in them because I knew more about design. I knew more about uh, uh, and I, he also made me go uh, to the library and get a book and find out what made flight. And of course, that's why I became a pilot as a young man. That's why I enjoy flying still today. In fact, one time for two years, I sold life insurance only to airline pilots, pilots and only to pilots. I just wanted to be around airports. I wanted to be around planes. And it started then. And he would tell me, show me, let me, correct me, so on, until I knew every piece of it. <clears throat> It was a struggle and difficult at times, but can you imagine the joy in my heart the first time one of my planes flew? It was in my head. It was a part of me. I was a part of the clouds. I was a part of the sky. 
We, we merged together. It's, it was in my heart. It's in my toenails, in my, my toenails to my eyeballs. When I was in the Army in Port Jackson, South Carolina, I set a record putting a, a, taking a rifle to, apart and putting a rifle back together again. Taking a rifle apart, I did it quicker and faster than anybody in the whole battalion, thanks to my dad. Now, what did this system do for me? Everything. My dad taught me the principles that have guided my life. Without him telling me, showing me, letting me, correcting me over and over, there would never have been an SMI, an LMI, or an FMI, nor would I have written the, at age 19 what we now call the Paul J. Meyer success plan, or it was the Million Dollar Person Success Plan, <clears throat> nor would we have been able to develop the unique prospecting system, nor would we have the plan of action in our programs. Because of his method of teaching, he left me an incredible legacy. I used what he taught me, the principles to formulate all of our programs. These programs have changed the lives of more people than any other author in the field of leadership or motivation in history. That's a legacy that was passed on from my father to me, from me to you, to you to your clients. I want to mention my, my friend John Edmund Haggai. He's the founder of the Haggai Institute for Advanced Leadership Training. This is what he said, spaced repetition is the mother of all skill and the mother of permanent change. That is because one hearing or reading makes little, if any, permanent response. It cannot change a belief, send a man to the ballot box, or influence him to contribute to a charity. <clears throat> we do not make people see, feel, or do anything with just one encounter. An important message requires repetition if it's going to have its intended result. That's why spaced repetition makes sense. That's why it's the secret ingredient of our programs. The magic ingredient of all of our programs is spaced repetition. Many of you know the following statistics, but you've heard it 50 times, you use it and sell them, but I'm gonna read it again anyway. According to author and consultant William J. Tobin, here's what happens to an idea without repetition when you give it to 100 people. The first time I heard, heard this, I said, well, that can't really be true, but it is. After 24 hours, 25 have forgotten it. That makes me feel bad that out of each hundred of you here tomorrow, 25 of you are going to remember anything I said. After 48 hours, 50 have forgotten it. That's half the crowd. I'm getting depressed. After four days, 85 have forgotten it. And after 16 days, 98 out of 100. That means 98% of you... In one month, I'm not going to remember anything I said here today. Listen, pay attention, take notes. I want to change that. It's been proven and documented again and again and again. 62% of the acceptance of all ideas come after the sixth time they're presented. Presented, 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 presented. I think you're going to remember a little bit more of my talk than most people's because I'm using a little spaced repetition, and I'm going to show it to you in different ways. As we hear something six times, here's what happens in our subconscious mind. If it's something to do, we, because of our negative condition, we usually say, I can't. And that's pretty loud in our subconscious mind and drowns out something being said. Then it's a little more faint, a little more faint, and then finally you think, well, maybe I can. And then the can, can gets louder and louder, and then the I can is I'm going to do it. And it's the same way with disbelief. Disbelief, 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 dis And then I believe, I believe, I believe. And here's the sequence. When people are first exposed to a new idea or thought, here's what happens. First exposure, rejection. I reject it because it conflicts with my preconceived ideas. Like the first time I showed somebody one of our programs on a 12-inch LP record, the guy said, why in God's name would anybody ever want to listen to a book or listen to something on a record? Well, I felt like that was a little bit of rejection of what I was saying. The second exposure, resistance. Well, I understand it, but I can't accept it. Third exposure, partial acceptance. I agree with the idea, but I have reservations as to its use. Fourth exposure, full acceptance. You know that idea expresses, expresses the way that I've been thinking. Fifth exposure, partial assimilation. I use that idea today, I think it's pretty terrific. Sixth exposure, full assimilation. Means he's internalized it. I gave that idea to one of my associates today. In the truest sense of the word, it's really my idea. 
I take in new information in my brain. I listen to it with spaced repetition. My mind accepts the new information or idea. It softens my heart, and I accept it emotionally. Very, very important, left out most of the time. I now have desire and passion and a new, and a new will to take action. The result, changed attitude and changed behavior. No one will ever change by reading a book, attending a seminar one time. Our change only comes by our will after our head and heart acceptance of new information. And for those of you associated with this, you need to get this down and use this information. Intellectual change of mind comes first, then emotional change of heart, and then volitional change of will. We make choices and we make decisions after we have information and after we buy into it. In 451 BC, Confucius said, what I hear I forget, what I see I remember, what I do I understand. Another advantage of spaced repetition and a plan of action is that when people are focused, and there's a big word, focused, I had, a, had a, an attorney friend of mine come to the office the other day, and I said, Mike, uh, you've been doing this 30 years. You were one of the top 25 estate planning attorneys. Uh, is there any kind of common denominator or something about all these people, any commonality? And he said, well, actually, uh, if they were educated and uneducated, uh, uh, fat and thin, uh, short and tall, uh, black and white, Indian, every kind Every, from every place in the world. Uh, and, I, and he said, but, uh, he said, yeah, there's one common denominator of all of them, and that's, that is their ability to stay focused, like a heat-seeking missile or a laser. That's the one single com common denominator he said about all of them, uh, plus having a positive attitude. But we need, to, you, we are not going to be able to learn to focus on anything until we can get it crystal clear in our mind. It will not be crystal, crystal clear in our mind until our eyes can see it. Or like the poet says, what thou seest, that thou beest. There isn't, and you've heard me say this before, there isn't any science, dogma, creed, or religion in the world that will allow you to attract or draw anything to you that your thought repels. And your thought will repel any and everything that you can't see, can't describe, or can't put down in black and white. It requires focused attention. All outside distractions must be eliminated. People get annoyed with me sometime when they're in my office and I'm talking to them and the phone rings. They look over at the phone. They're expecting me to look at the phone. They expect me to pick up the phone. I don't even hear the phone. It's a little problem with Jane and I sometime, but I'm working on it. In the 1880s, Herbert Ebbinghaus discovered this. He discovered that if people are exposed to an idea one time in 30 days, they retain less than 10%. So we're talking about 100 and something years ago. And then 100 years later, Albert Mayraben presented some fascinating information in a book, Silent Messages. In his research, Mayraben found that if people were exposed to an idea one time, at the end of 30 days, they retained 10%. Well, that's the same thing the other guy said 100 years ago. But if they were exposed to an idea six times with interval reinforcement, they retained more than 90%. Well, his research was done in 1980. I discovered that in 1950, 30 years earlier, thanks to my father. Internal reinforcement means that the idea was presented once, then again the next day and the next day and the next day, then again the next week and the next week, then again the next month and the next month, and so on. In other words, there were intervals between each review. That's why we suggest in our programs that people listen to each lesson every day for six days in a row, and then after completing the program, start at the beginning again, do it over again. After completing the program, start again and do it over again. Spaced repetition is the same thing as interval reinforcement. That means to present an idea once, and then again, and then again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and then a week later, then a month later, and a year later. Let's add something to that. Studies at the University of Wisconsin showed an improvement of up to 200% when vocabulary was taught using visual aids and participation. In other words, one picture says a thousand words. That's why I've never made a sale without using a, a visual, a picture visual. Studies at Harvard and Columbia showed up to 38% improvement in retention with the use of visuals 
or using mental pictures. Also, the time required to penetrate someone's subconscious mind, that's when you're making a sale, and have material learned and believed can be reduced by 40% with spaced repetition and graphics. Listen to this one. The average person speaks at 110 to 160 words a minute. However, the problem is we think at the rate of 400 to 500 words a minute. So using visual pictures, being involved, working in a plan of action bridges the leadership gap. Consider the following statistics on a value of spaced repetition. We remember 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we hear and see, 70% of what we read, hear, and say, 90% of what we read, hear, say, and then do, but with interval and spaced repetition. The reason that we remember details which have been hammered into us precisely, that they have been brought to us again and again and again and again. For example, six times six is what? What's eight times nine? What's 12 times 12? What's 16 times 16? There you are, it's 256. The answer is simple. We've been taught in school and learned repetition up to 12 times 12. We didn't learn 13 times 13 or 12 times 13 or 14. We didn't learn that, so we don't know it. Never, never, never underestimate the value of spaced repetition. It's our magic ingredient and one of the powerful ideas of our programs that help change people's lives. Obviously, the other is the content of the program. Spaced repetition as a key part of our system helps people learn and change. And our plan of action, which provides interaction, helps accelerate the learning, but more important, personal involvement. Spaced repetition and personal involvement increases retention, increases belief, increases belief, and motivates people to actually work in a plan of action and put it into action. That's what I call change. Our programs provide ample opportunity for repetition of content until it is totally mastered and hammered home. This combination of spaced repetition and personal involvement helps hammer home the ideas presented, and here's what happens. Slowly but surely, over a period of time, we have a thinking change, and we have an attitude change, and we have a behavior change, and then obviously we have an output different change. That is, why it's, that is what is required for not only total mastery, but for, a lifelong, for being a lifelong practitioner of goal setting. Only with total mastery is it probable that any idea learned will ever be put into action. Spaced repetition requires total mastery. Any person who is intelligent enough can listen to a message and echo it. But the power of the message is not in the echo. The power in the message is what the message means to the person listening to it and what that person does with the message. That's his exact words off of his tape. He was living proof of the power of spaced repetition. He was the ultimate product of the product. And what did he change? He changed his personality. He changed his thinking. He changed his attitude. He changed his self-image. He changed his belief about himself. He changed his capacity to produce, and he changed his productivity. But, like all of us, he had a dormant dream down inside, a sleeping giant, a piece of genius that he thought would never come up. It was there since he was a young man, but it had been lying dormant. It was a piece of genius, but his self-image, his low self-image, and his negative conditioning had encapsulated it and wouldn't let it out. My question to all of you is, do you have something down inside of you that's been encapsulated and it hasn't come out, but it's screaming to come out? I guess all of you know that I'm a driven person. I'm passionate to help people. I feel like God called me and put me on this earth to help people discover their untapped potential. But it will never happen if we don't escape mediocrity and come out from underneath the hindering circumstances that have here, heretofore stopped us. This can only be done by becoming a practitioner of goal setting and mastering it and fine tuning it to a science. 
mastering it, fine-tuning it to a science. I believe in every single person in this room. Amazingly, probably more than you believe in yourself. Because thanks to my mother and dad, I don't see anybody as they are now. I only see them as how they can become if they use what was down inside of them. You only live on this earth one time. Your life is worth taking the time to think about. Your life is worth significantly more than just getting by. Your life is worth more than being a puppet on someone else's string or, or a marionette on someone else's stage. You are unique. You are special. There never has been in all history anyone like you, and there never will be again. You can have anything you want to have and be anything you want to be and go anywhere you want to go. And the magic carpet awaits to take you there. I would like to challenge everyone here not to just sell our programs, just to make some money, but rather to become like the gentleman I spoke of and become a product of the product. I mean in your guts. I suggest that regardless of how long you've been with us, and some of you have been with us five years, 10 years, 25 years, or 30 years, and some of you 40 years, I'd like to ask you to start all over at the beginning, pick out one of the programs that has meant the most to you in the past and that has the potential to change your life and then start over again and make a commitment or covenant with yourself, your spouse, or a friend that you will listen to that program uh, once each day for uh, six days, go through the program and do it again and again and again, start again and listen again. Then start over the same program and do it again. Start with the same program and do it again. Start with the same program and do it again. Start with the same program and do it again. Start with the same program and do it again. That'll take about 10 or 12 months. And then while doing it, work with a, new, a renewed thought and a renewed freshness and a renewed zeal and a renewed enthusiasm and a renewed confidence in the plan of action. Write down things in there you never even dreamed of writing down before because you're a turned on and you have that uh, high experience. And do it as though your life depended on it because the greater life in you does depend on it. Do this and I guarantee you that you will grow more as a person this year than any year that you've ever been on planet Earth. I challenge you to continue to share this magic and this secret and our programs with every, everyone you meet, but do it with carefree abandonment let your child out. Do it with belief and confidence. Do it with zeal and enthusiasm. And do it with passion and conviction. You can do it because you will be a product of the product. God bless you. Thank you, Paul J. Meyer. Let's thank